The following program is brought to you free of charge by the sponsorship of Novos Ordo Watch. See for yourself that the Church of the Second Vatican Council is not in fact the Catholic Church of the Ages. Go to NovosOrdoWatch.org. to another episode of the history of Christendom. In our last episode, we detailed many of the disorders that came after a, a restoration of temporary, after the problems of Napoleon, which then descended into revolutions in 1830, 1848, and leading to German and Italian unification in 1870, as well as the loss of the Pope's temporal possessions that year, which was also the year of the premature closing of the Vatican Council. In this episode, we're going to talk about 1914 up to present day, and we're going to situate it to start with the idea of secularism, which is so normal to us that we don't realize that it's a grave disorder. What is secularism, Your Excellency? Secularism is the complete divorce of the state and of social life in general from religion. The religion is something purely personal, private, should never in any way overflow into uh, the law, the state, or social life. Uh, that's secularism. So all of the institutions have to be secularized. The government has to be secularized. Uh, religion cannot play a part in in any way uh, with regard to uh, any kind of public life. That's secularism, and that uh, that's really the, again comes out of the French Revolution and ultimately out of Protestantism because Protestantism is uh, reduces religion to the interior entirely. Uh, it is your personal relationship with God. You are your own Pope because you pick up the scriptures and decide for yourself what you're going to believe. And it, it, it totally personalizes your religion. So uh, even churches are not something which are founded by God, but they are founded by human beings for people who have similar religious experiences and want to come together and worship together. So even the externalization of, of religion and Protestantism is, uh, again, the result of this uh, personal experience of, of God, as, the, as they would say. And so it, its roots are in that, that there is, uh, that uh, religion should not have a public role. Now, it did in in, in England. It did. Uh, they were, you know, they were start, there were state religions. There actually still is a state religion in England. Uh, in the northern countries, uh, Sweden, for example, I think Denmark too. Uh, uh, there was a, a an, an external, uh, let's just say, recognition of religion, but. Uh, the the principles of it were of secularism were were in Protestantism, and so with the coming of what uh, the period of unbelief, in the 18th century, uh, this idea of separation of church and state became very very prevalent, uh, and uh, it was enacted in the Constitution of the United States for the first time in the history of the whole world that the, uh, there was a country that did not have a public recognition of God or of religion in its constitution. Uh, that had, it was not known since the beginning of time. Uh, the, in, in, uh, if you look at all of the ancient um, civilizations, they, there was always some sort of religion, a priesthood connected with the, the government. Uh, but so the, the, the indifferent state, not because the, the American Constitution is not hostile to religion, 
but it is indifferent to religion. And it doesn't matter what church you belong to, or it doesn't matter if you're an atheist or an agnostic. Uh, the only thing it's looking at is your temporal welfare. Uh, so that that's where secularism was born. Uh, the French Revolution took all of the principles of the 18th century and expanded them and expressed them. And so the 19th century became uh, um, a place in which these ideas gradually developed and, and were considered uh, to be the ideal uh, that there should, the, the state should be without religion uh, and laws should, should not pay attention to religion. Uh, so that, that you see that gradually happening. You see, uh, especially in the latter part of the 19th century, the Third Republic in France uh, uh, becoming practically atheistic. Um, and so, the, again, the, the church had to deal with that. Uh, the, the period from 1848 to, 18, to 1918, let's say, the end of the First World War, is a, is a period of the gradual disintegration of the union of church and state in Europe, in the Catholic countries of Europe. Uh, gradual disintegration. Uh, the World War I overturned everything and it gave rise to a, a, an idea of a new world order. So in 1919 you have the Congress of, uh, excuse me, the, the Treaty of Versailles and all of the meetings in Paris and Versailles. Uh, and, and there was this uh, dreamy idea of a new world order. Uh, Wilson said uh, Christianity has failed to give peace to the world and now uh, democracy must do it. So, that, that was, so the, the democracy was extolled as the, be <coughs> the best possible government and uh, all of the principles of liberalism were also extolled and uh, the institutions of the world, and especially the Western world, were uh, made to be in conformity with it. And, and part of that was secularism. One of those outgrowths of sec secularism, which might be more familiar to some of our viewers, is Americanism. Can you explain what that is, Your Excellency? Well, yes, it well depends on what you mean by it. Uh, there is a heresy of Americanism, uh, which was condemned by uh, Pope Leo XIII in 1899, <clears throat> uh, which had various uh, aspects to it. Uh, the uh, One of them was the accentuation of the active virtues over the passive virtues, that is, an active life over contemplative life. Uh, that was one of them. But underneath was uh, this idea of conforming the the church to the modern world. It was a, a, a predecessor of modernism, or a, I would just say a sidecar to the modernism mo motorcycle. Uh, and uh, it had many of the principles of modernism in it. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, another way to take Americanism is the, the uh, idea that the American system is the best system, that is an indifferent state where the church has the ability to flourish and be on its own and not be bothered by the government, uh, uh, but at the same time it does not get itself involved but in the government. So uh, that, that the society is secularized and that all religions have the ability to function and to profess themselves and to uh, a complete indifference to religion, uh, but you know you have to say the in the United States is favorable to religion in general. Uh, its laws of exempting religious groups from taxes, for example, it would, uh, is is virtually unknown in other countries. Uh, the uh, uh, so there's, there's no trouble in practicing your faith in this country, but still you you have that problem that there is a divorce between the uh, the government and religion. The effect is that you have a group of people either on the Supreme Court or in the uh, legislative body that are making moral decisions, decisions that pertain to the Catholic Church. Uh, uh, 
and they are even making decisions that pertain to natural law that anybody can know about. Uh, so they're, they're coming up with the idea that uh, getting rid of a baby in a mother's womb is not hurting anybody. That these uh, little babies uh, are actually a, some, are a threat to the mother and uh, that therefore they should be removed. Uh, this is barbaric. Uh, it, 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 it cries out for, for vengeance to heaven. Uh, it, it is the most wicked form of cold-blooded murder. But this is what happens. There is nothing to appeal to. There is no code of morals to appeal to to stop that. So, so why not? And with the idea of freedom, the cult of freedom that you can do whatever you please as long as it doesn't hurt someone else. There's nothing to stop it because they have decided that the little baby is not a person or has no rights, and so therefore you're not hurting anybody. Nothing to stop that. The same is true of pornography and, and all of the other things that are offensive to decent morals. Uh, these things are permitted to to run loose because there is no moral law uh, directing the laws of the nation. And the, the, it is inconceivable to, to have a, uh, a secular law that is not in some way directed by the moral law, at least the natural law, at least. And if you detach yourself from the natural law, you are committing social and national suicide. All the disorders you point out, you have to see, I think are well taken. When I, when I try to think about how this branch of Americans or this idea of Americanism came forward, I think it, part of it was the United States going from becoming a mission territory to, in a short number of years, becoming the single largest contributor to the Holy See. I think you've said on more than one occasion that the Holy Father Gregory XVI <coughs> said, nowhere am I Pope more than in the United States. So I think some of the American bishops, you know, got their chests puffed up and said, well, look at, look at us, look at all the success and uh, typical practical Americans. We, we, we've got these good fruits. That means our system is really great. And that led to this disordered way of thinking. Yes, it is a flawed system, very flawed system, but which has by accident uh, a, a good effect. Uh, so, and that is that the church can flourish unmolested. And the fact that it does flourish unmolested transferred in the minds of, of Catholic American prelates, transferred uh, over, you might say, or, or mutated, you might say, in their minds into the idea that this is the ideal that this is not a flawed system. This is the way it should be. And that crept into Vatican II. That it was none other than Cardinal Spellman who brought in religious liberty. Uh, his, uh, his theologian was John Courtney Murray, who was the author of the document on religious liberty, uh, which essentially sets out the American system. Uh, and it's something that is offensive to the Catholic Church. That is the indifferent state and uh, giving people the civil right to practice false religions, which implicitly is based on a right, a moral right, to commit a sin. Uh, uh, objectively, it is a mortal sin to embrace a false religion. So it is, you could not possibly have a civil right to do something which is morally evil. So if you have a civil right, it means that you are implicitly saying there is a moral right to embrace a, a false religion. That does not agree with what Moses said and did when he came down and saw the golden calf. If it is pleasing to God to worship a false god, false religion, to, to have a false religion, then why was Moses so upset with the Jews when he saw the golden calf? Why did he destroy it? And why did God instruct him to slay all of those who had worshipped the golden calf? 
See, there, there is... Uh, These days, horses would just be called the rigorous. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a famous author by the name of uh, Walsh who pointed out in his book on the Inquisition that no one in history ever put more people to death over worshipping the wrong religion than Moses. Mm. And that was at the command of God. This ties into another question, Your Excellency. As you mentioned, the idea of this divorce of state from religion, <clears throat> religion is merely a private affair. Some people who were trained in secular countries, grew up in secular countries, they might become subconsciously defensive here and might say, well, Your Excellency, why is religion not merely a private matter? Doesn't our Lord tell us to go to our room and close the door and pray in private and, and he will hear us? Why is, it, why is religion not merely a private affair? Because man, by his very nature, is social, and he, he as an individual, owes uh, adoration and obedience to God, and as he is social, he owes adoration and obedience to God. Uh, the, the nation is something that is created by God, that is, that government and order that comes from government and all of the social connections of human beings are something ordered by God. It is natural to man to uh, long for these things. He sets up governments wherever he goes. He has a social order wherever he goes. It is natural law. And God is as much the, the God of the social order and the governmental order as he is of the individual or the household. You pointed out already in this episode, Your Excellency, that by 1918 and 1919, we've, we've definitively ended the, the Catholic order of civilization, which reached its high point in the Middle Ages. And I think it's important for our listeners to see that the same connectedness in our current time period as we saw in the previous episode when we talked about Congress of Vienna of 1814 is connected to 1830, connected to 1848, connected to 1870 that there is a narrative that is cohesive along all of those dates. The same is true in this period, that 1914 is merely the midway between 1870 and 1941, in which we see a rise of nationalism, almost as a new religion, with your country's national interest as the sumum bonum, the end of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and a world that is, quote-unquote, safe for democracy, for instance. Yes, well, the, the rise of nationalism uh, is a, an interest. I, I think it is attached to the uh, decline of the church. The church is the mystical body of Christ, and people felt a camaraderie, especially in Catholic Europe, because of the Catholic Church. And people are very much bonded by the Catholic Church, even though they would differ in land and nationality and language, etc. They would all feel a certain commonness, a very deep commonness. That disappeared, and I, I think that the, as a result, the the craving for commonness uh, became stronger on a natural plane, and that is with nationalism. Um, there was also the, the drive, you might call it the pursuit of power. Uh, there, there was a tremendous uh, uptick in commerce and industry in the 19th century. Wealth and the desire for wealth, the appetite for wealth, the appetite to become super rich. And therefore, the, uh, you, know, you become rich by colonies and, and having... Uh, uh, all of the uh, economic uh, advantages of colonies. So there was a, the 19th century saw, uh, late 18th century and 19th century saw a great expansion of colonialism and that enhanced nationalism. You see, this is, this is the British Empire, this is the German Empire, this is the French Empire, and uh, everyone became uh, quite cocky about their empires and jealous of their empires, and uh, it led to a good deal of conflict over empire. Uh, and uh, so I, I think that was part of it too, is that uh, the, the national interest became much 
more prevalent, the, the, the power of each country, the economic power uh, and, and influence of each country uh, became much more prevalent than it had been. Uh, huge standing armies and, and uh, uh, tremendous investment in military uh, equipment and, and navies and uh, uh, showing strength and, and uh, uh, influence and power. Uh, a really form of national pride. I think that that's that's what uh, it led to, um, and the rise of democracy too. The the idea of uh, losing the idea of authority, uh, which uh, is intrinsic in the French Revolution, that, that there is no no one can tell you what to do, and the we only uh, agree to. Uh, restrain ourselves because we think it's the best thing. But no one can really tell you what to do or what to think or anything like that. So the uh, in these empires like the Austro-Hungarian and, and various other uh, places, you saw uh, a resentment of the, the monarch and the, a resentment of the whole idea that someone has the power from God to govern you. See, so the, the, the principles... Uh, of monarchy uh, were eaten away, and so you saw the disappearance of four monarchies in uh, 1919, uh, the uh, Russian, of course, the German, the Austro-Hungarian, and the Turkish, and four empires, the, and uh, the setting of the world on the path of democracy, extolling democracy as, as the best thing that could ever happen to the world, and it will bring peace, peace to the world, and uh, everyone will be happy. Uh, this was Woodrow Wilson, who was a dreamer. And the League of Nations, and we will uh, you know, never have a war again because we will uh, solve our problems by sanctions uh, and the, we won't go to war but we will economically starve someone who is acting up that was the idea and uh, so yes. what do you make of it? is that is that an indictment that can be laid against Christianity in which Wilson the Christianity hasn't delivered world peace is that is that the promise is that a promise of Christianity well, certainly it's in the rule book of Christianity. Of course, the, uh, people don't necessarily observe it, but it is true that the, uh, the wars of the Middle Ages uh, were nowhere near as destructive or disruptive, nowhere near as those of the wars of religion when Europe split between Catholicism and Protestantism, and especially the Thirty Years' War, which is extremely brutal, uh, and uh, and the then the subsequent wars uh, as Europe, Europe became more secularized, like the Seven Years' War, for example. Very, it was almost some refer to it as the First World War uh, because it was fought in many places, uh, and uh, but the uh, uh, as the nineteenth century progressed. The uh, in most of the uh, warfare of the 19th century was from the left I and mean, movements of the left, not from the right. Uh, not uh, it was from uh, pursuit of power and bravado and braggadocio um, and uh, pursuit of uh, land grabbing and, and uh, expansion. Uh, so the. Uh, and I would say that is the result of um, a general loss of religion and uh, uh, excessive attention to the things of this world. I would say. Well, I think sometimes people speak disdainfully of the wars of religion and say, well, you know, back in the bad old days, you died for your religion. And I think you pointed out on more than one occasion, well, what exactly did people die for in these wars? If we look at if we look at the motivation that took people to war, at least one could say if you're dying for your religion, something you believe in. That's entirely different than dying so that the Sudetenland can can be taken, or that we can take back Alsace. Yes, the religion is something that goes goes the deepest into your soul. It rules your soul. It it, it tells you what is right and what is wrong. 
it directs you to the next life. It, 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 uh, it completely overtakes your everything you think and do. So your religion is very important and the practice of your religion is very important and all of the culture that religion breeds is very important. Uh, so that's why religious wars are the most bitter because there are high stakes in religious wars and, and uh, people want to retain their religion, they want to retain the practice of their religion. The, the secularist wars, we might say, are fought over land and uh, as I said, land grabbing. And the, the Europe has a bit, the history of Europe in modern times has been a history of land grabbing. Uh, the the uh, always uh, trying to get something else. Uh, wars of conquest and and uh, uh, just uh, not being content with what you have and and not seeing that it is not seeing the balance that well maybe we have to give up a piece of property or we won't grab this piece of property. For example, the Austrians, uh, Austro-Hungarians grabbed Bosnia Herzegovina in 1908. To the fury of the Russians, who consider themselves the protectors of those Balkan states, uh, and it was just a, a diplomatic subterfuge whereby they wanted to take apart and uh, piece by piece the Turkish Empire. Everybody was getting a piece of the Turkish Empire. It was weak. It was the old man of Europe, as the, as Sir Nicholas the First called it, a sick man of Europe. I'm sorry, the sick man of Europe. And uh, so Austria thought, you know, you know we'll take some. And uh, so that enraged Serbia, because there were Serbs in Bosnia, Herzegovina, that enraged Serbia. And of course, then the, the Russians became enraged too. The French were always looking for a, an excuse to have another war with Germany. And so they were happy too that there was a, a war brewing, etc. But it was all over really something quite silly and the the or minor in relation to what happened in that war which just the devastation of europe and, and misery and death and maiming uh the, uh the the kaiser said right down to the last keep it a local war just let austria and serbia fight it out it's not worth engaging all of europe in this conflict but nobody listened to him. Everybody just mobilized their armies and, and you know, the rest of the story, as they say. Uh, and so it was really a, a useless war. It had bad effects, very bad effects. And it caused so much hatred in the French for Germany that uh, it was indirectly the cause of World War II because of the stripping of Germany of all of its dignity, you might say, and its, its ability even to feed itself and to, to function properly. Uh, that, uh, and Benedict XV said that, that the Treaty of Versailles will just bring on another war. Well, Bismarck had said that the next possible war could come from some foolish thing in the Balkans, I think he, he mentioned. But as, as you say, with, with this revanchism, it's interesting, if you read the literature of the time going into World War I, it's fascinating to find the dominance in the French mind of there must be an accounting for Alsace-Lorraine, there must be an accounting for Sedan, that they had to have this revenge, and it dominated the entire generation. And the young sons were told, one day, we are going to take it back, and necessarily, this feeds into war. This accelerates in our time period now. We're, we're somewhat victims of our technology. Technology helps to accelerate conflict by by creating the, the news media pulls in public opinion by sharing which media they would like to and as we saw in world war one and world war two treaties widen the conflict instead of having having it be a local conflict you then involve all these other people now who didn't necessarily have anything to do with the conflict in the first place mm -hmm. yes those treaties and those war guarantees are extremely foolish and dangerous uh, Every war has its sides, and many times people are <laughs> on different sides in different wars. Uh, you know, people who are allies are, are enemies and vice versa. And so to make a permanent war guarantee is a very dangerous thing to do uh, because people change and times change. And you would have to look at 
your own national interests in going to war. Uh, so, uh, and you know, we're seeing that a little bit now with uh, this war in Ukraine. Um, you know, the Kaiser would say, if he were alive, keep it local. You know, this is a struggle between Ukraine and Russia. They have to fight it out, and uh, whatever the outcome is, that will be the outcome. Uh, but it's not worth the whole world's coming together and having a, a, a major exchange of fire over this problem. And, you know, there could be another video about that, but the, the uh, um, it, it's uh, uh, yeah, not a good idea to, to have these alliances. And George Washington said no uh, permanent alliances with anybody, you know, except in, if it's in the interest of the United States. He said no standing army as well, right? Did he? I don't know. I, I, I wouldn't be surprised. But the, that's the 18th century. You need, you need a standing army. Now. <laughs> it's the 18th. Times change and, and circumstances change. So, uh, uh, so, it, it, but World War One was a a, a watershed. Uh, it, it was the end of the last vestiges of the old order and the beginning of the nightmare that we are living now. Uh, it was the rise of socialism. Uh, democracy and socialism are twin sisters. Uh, and uh, you saw the, the, the world go crazy. Uh, you saw even the women's clothing uh, become immodest. Uh, overnight almost. Um, the, uh, you saw the rise of the film industry and dirty pictures. Uh, the, the, the films, many films made in the 1920s, the silent ones even were filthy dirty. Uh, uh, the original Ben Hur was, was of that nature, uh, made silent in the nineteen in the nineteen twenties, and uh, I looked at it once. I had to turn it off. It was so dirty. Mm. Uh, so the that that idea of just letting yourself go uh, was very much a part of the nineteen twenties, um, and the nineteen twenties were very prosperous. Uh, and uh, there was this idea of the war is over, and now we're going to celebrate. And, uh, all sorts of bad things happened as a result of World War I. Um, and uh, it, there was a, 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 at least the vestiges of some moral order, uh, natural law, etc., in, in pre-World War I Western civilization that disappeared after World War I. Well, I think it's interesting. We're recording this in early 2022. As you know, that there's a war in Ukraine going on at the time. But in a certain sense, it's been going on since 2014, since Crimea was reunited to Russia. And there were local wars going on in Donbass and some of these other regions. It just seems now that part of the, you, you noted the problem of the war guarantee. There's NATO on Russia's doorstep. And as you say, we could probably do an entire episode just on just on the, the, the differences here. But this is NATO is supposed to be part of this new world order that's going to solve everything. We're going to have a permanent organization, treaty organization. It's going to save us. If someone gets attacked, then we're we're all going to attack. But it was it's brinksmanship that at least one of the aspects of why the war has widened now to to an invasion has been because of NATO's continued expansion to the east and into, into Russia. Yes, nobody learned the lesson of World War I and the Treaty of Versailles. And that is you don't humiliate a great country, even if they have had setbacks and maybe lost a war. You don't strip them of their dignity. And that's what the West did to Russia when the Soviet Union fell in 1991. Uh, the, it, it stripped it of its dignity. It was a great power, no matter what you want to say about it. It was a great power in the world, in the sense of very strong power, something respected, quote-unquote, for its immense uh, abilities to destroy, at least that. It had, you might say, a, a place in the world and a certain pride. It was... Uh, very badly treated by the Western powers, and uh, and the, the we're seeing the reaction to that now. I, I think Putin is 
is trying to restore Russia as a uh, a nation with pride and, and a nation that is uh, that, that uh, can take its place with the great nations of history, uh, and uh, and so profiting from the weakness of Russia, uh, NATO sought to to expand itself, and not only NATO but the West, the European Union, the United States sought to westernize what really was an eastern country. Ukraine has very similar language to Russia. It has very strong religious ties to Russia in the sense that they're both orthodox, as Ukrainian orthodox, as a Russian orthodox, but they both use the old Slavonic in their liturgy, etc. Uh, they, uh, and Ukraine also uh, contains Russian-speaking and Russian orthodox provinces, which is the Donbass. Uh, and also Crimea, which was taken by Russia in the 18th century from the Turks, and it belonged to Russia up until 1954 when Khrushchev gave it away to Ukraine. Now, the, under the constitution established by Stalin for the Soviet Union, because that was the, still the Soviet Union at the time in 1954, the 16 republics could secede from the Soviet Union anytime they wanted. So that means Khrushchev gave away something which is absolutely essential to Russian security, which is the, the, the Black Sea ports in Crimea, to something that could leave Russia, that could just opt out of the Soviet Union anytime it wanted to. Uh, so the, I think that's the source of the problem in Ukraine, is that uh, the, in Ukraine, I would say, imprudently listened to the West, all the enticements of the West, turned its back on Russia, with which it had many cultural and religious ties and lingual ties, historical ties. It has been part of the, um, uh, uh, the Russian Empire since uh, the 1600s. Uh, and uh, uh, the, so I, I think that, the, uh, that there was an imprudence of, of the Ukrainians to listen to the enticements of the West and to poke the dragon next door. Uh, and uh, so I think uh, Russia, I see the motive that Russia doesn't want NATO in its backyard. It doesn't want even the EU in its backyard. It wants a... Uh, something that is docile to Mother Russia in its backyard. I understand that. I don't think it was right for him to invade Ukraine because I think Russia should say, we have to pay the price of the stupidity of 70 years of communist rule to the stupidity of Stalin's constitution, the stupidity of Khrushchev's giving away of Crimea, uh, the stupidity of not claiming when Ukraine was made in the Soviet Union of those two provinces, the Donbass provinces, which have Russians in them. How did that end up with Ukraine? So, you know, there's, I think Russia has a price to pay for the many years in which it was bad. If they had not run out the czars, none of this would be taking place. So, you know, I, I think there's a, a fault on both sides. I think the, the Ukrainians, although they strictly have the right to join NATO, they have the right to uh, join the EU if they want, that's their business. I think, though, that they should have realized uh, what was next door, a fire-breathing dragon. And generally, you don't poke fire-breathing dragons especially when they are about 10 times the size of your country. I just think that hypocrisy is so unbelievable. I see we, we have the Cuban Missile Crisis over a little country off the coast of, of the United States having missiles from a foreign power, and we, we thought that that was worth a blockade, worth brinksmanship, but apparently someone else isn't allowed to do it. No. Or a country that was founded on secession doesn't permit the secession of the Donbass region or someone else who'd like to join Russia. That can't be permitted. No. No, it, there are many hypocritical uh, and inconsistent, uh, in, uh, inconsistent ideas in this. Yes. But you come on to an interesting point that I, I know some people will be looking to, which is 1917 and 
Fatima, Our Lady, pointing to the, the spreading of Russia's eras throughout the world. And this may be one of those high points of Russia spreading its errors. How would you respond to that? Well, this, this uh, uh, I think Russia did spread its errors throughout the world. Uh, look at our own country. Uh, I mean, socialism and communism has overtaken our government, has overtaken our educational system. Uh, you know, at least half the population is leftist and uh, communist. We have a great relationship with genocide China. Uh, and uh, the, uh, it makes everything we, uh, we use, uh, makes the clothing that we put on, all of our machines. Uh, in the good old days, the United States didn't even recognize the Chinese government. It had no embassy in China because it was a, a communist government that we would just have nothing to do with. And in the good old days, under, under Stalinist rule, in, in uh, Russia, the United States did not recognize that government either until the communist loving uh, Roosevelt's came to power, Mr. and Mrs. Uh, in the 1930s. And he recognized the communist government of Russia. He called Stalin Uncle Joe, who murdered at least 20 million people. Uh, the high end is 60 million and some even put it higher than that. Uncle Joe. That was an overnight transformation in the American press. One day communism was condemned, and the next day we must not speak such of our allies and you know, Father Coughlin and other people being marginalized. And I remember when Nixon went to China and opened up China, I thought to myself, that I was you know, maybe in my 20s, they are going to build up that country with industry, they're going to take all of our secrets, they're going to be industrialized, and they are going to attack us one day. I remember thinking that. They will become our enemy, and that's exactly what has happened. And we still don't have enough sense to cut them off. It, it happens all the time. You know, say I was uh, doing some work for a client the other day, and the, they pointed out this this small com this small company now with defense secrets. They just had a some intellectual property that was worth getting, and China had inserted a deep sort of deep cover spy, a university student who then would go on to interview for this company, and became, of course, the best candidate possible. Eighteen months into his employment, one day he disappears. All of the company files have been raided, and he's safely back in China with all the company secrets. Mm -hmm. And this is just one story among many. Oh, yeah. We still keep admitting their university students. We welcome mm -hmm. them to become researchers. Mm -hmm. And then we're surprised when this happens. Mm -hmm. In our next episode, we're going to continue talking about this 1914 to, to present day period, but talking about some of these larger international organizations that you've alluded to, the EU, the NATO, and other other appendages, the World Bank, the IMF, the WHO. But for now, Your Excellency, thank you for your time. Thank you. This program was brought to you free of charge by the sponsorship of Novus Ordo Watch. See for yourself that the Church of the Second Vatican Council is not in fact the Catholic Church of the Ages. Go to NovusOrdoWatch.org.